y'all never got to hear me speak. Yay for y'all. So, somebody look at your watch or your clock or your phone or whatever and let me know if I go really, really long. Because last time I spoke until about 1 o'clock and everybody was like super ready to get out of here. Um, you wouldn't know it, but you will see this message later. But I am actually very, very, very shy and very, um, what's the word? Don't like public speaking, all that good stuff. That may or may not be true anymore, but <laughs> because when I do actually speak in public, I usually talk for a long time. So this morning, up until last night, we had a crazy busy weekend. Jason's supposed to be leaving about town to work, and um, I kept asking him, like, are you going to speak or am I going to speak? Because he was supposed to leave Saturday, and then he didn't leave Saturday, and so he was like, I, I probably will, I probably will. And so, then this morning I wake up at like 7.30, and I'm like, hey, are you definitely going to speak? He's like, no, you're, you're probably going to have to. So I had like maybe 30 minutes to an hour on my front porch to come up with something to talk to you all about today, which I already had kind of a little idea in my mind. So I asked the Lord, when I sat down with my Bible, I was like, all right, so, you know, we were, we've been talking about David and Goliath and weapons, and we felt like you know, we needed to spend a little bit of time and like put weapons in your hands. Like, what do you consider weapons? And so I asked the Lord, I said, <clears throat> you know, what um, what weapons do we need? Because it's real easy, I think, growing up in church, you know, all the scriptures, like the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and, you know, all of these different, you put on the whole armor of God, but what does that mean? Like, how does that actually help you when you're having a bad day and something needs to be happening like super quick? So I asked him, I was like, all right, what are the weapons? And so this is what he spoke to me. We know Jason taught last week on love. And so it's kind of neat because all four of them start with W, and the weapon starts with W, which is, I think, kind of cool. But y'all might not. <laughs> so number one, he said, who are you? Who is he? And then the word, which is obviously, you know, what he said. And then who is with us? And so um, I was like, all right. If these are weapons, when do we use them and how do we use them? So, the first one of who are you? So, who wants to volunteer? Anybody? Glenn? Glenn, you don't want to volunteer? Come on, look. I'm a child of God. Son no, of God. No, 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 I haven't even told you what yet. So, who am I? All right. Stand up. Okay. <laughs> And imagine that I have never met you before. This is not church. This is not, you know, a church Sunday school answer. Hey, my name's Kim. Who are you? Jason. Okay. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about you. <laughs> okay, I'm sitting right <laughs> Well, I would still start off with that. I'm a son of God. Somebody who, uh, you know, I love excitement, I love adventure, I love God, I love everything that he's made, and I love enjoying it. So the stranger that just met you the first time was like, you a weirdo. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> All right, who else? Somebody else? One more person volunteered. Hey, I'm Kim. How Hi. are you? I'm Christine. I'm a housewife. I'm a mother of three. And I'm married for 16 years. And I enjoy going to the park that my kids play. Cool. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. All right. So that kind of, like, actually answers my whole thing. So the most basic answer, when I asked the Lord this, I was like, all right, Lord, you know, like, if this is a weapon, and it doesn't seem like a weapon to me, or it didn't when he first started speaking to this to me, you know, the most basic answer people would give is your name, maybe where you live, you know, if you're really trying to make a connection, I'm thinking you might go as far as to say who you are. You know, if you're Brittany Wilson and you live in Loosedale, you're going to say, hey, my granny is Linda Goff and, you know, I'm kidding to half the people in the county because you want to make a connection with these people. So, like, who, who you, you know, who you're connected to. If you are meeting somebody for the first time on a business level, you know, like for me, I might say, you know, my name's Kim Blackwell. I work for the State Department of Health. 
you know, I know so and so and so and so to kind of like open up a door of connection or whatever of who you are. And then the whole family, you know, like who your family is, that's usually a really, really good indicator where people start to try to really tell like who they are. You know, when you start getting a little past the, my name is so and so. So I don't have the scripture on the thing. I don't know if Christian can look it up how that works about David and Goliath. But <clears throat> anybody want to look it up and read it again? I can look it up on my phone. I need to make it bigger. <laughs> gathered their forces for war. We're going to kind of read through this whole little chapter again just because um, well, Naomi wasn't here. Some of y'all have been here and haven't been here. Um, they gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soka and Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes between Soka and Azekiah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Eli and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and bronze javelin, the slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So... <clears throat> I was reading back through the story because, you know, I had only a few minutes to kind of get ready. And um, it got me to thinking about, okay, if the question is, who are you? Then I was like, okay, well, they went to all this trouble to describe Goliath, you know, like, so sometimes what we wear, um, and this is how I study the Bible, it might seem crazy to y'all. Y'all are going to be stuck with me for a couple of weeks, so. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, so why did it specify over and over and over that he wore this that was made of bronze, and he wore this that was made of bronze. You're like, what is the significance of bronze? So then I Googled that and like rabbit trailed a little ways into the bronze thing. And it's kind of interesting if you want to look it up. I'm not going to go into that today because it's a whole other rabbit trail. But <clears throat> it was important for a reason. And so I got to thinking like, sometimes when you meet people or when you are going to meet somebody, you get dressed up because, the, you know, what you wear says something about who you are. And um, so I was like, okay, so Goliath, before he ever even opened his mouth, when he first met some, you know, when he first met David, he already was saying who he was. Because with the whole bronze part aside, he was a warrior. I mean, if it's saying that he wore all of this, um, his armor said that he was mighty and that he didn't really have a lot of cheats in his armor. I mean, he was covered. He was, you know, he was a killer, basically. And so I was like, okay, Lord, so who you are is important, and what you wear sometimes even speaks into who you are. And so I kind of read on down a little bit further, and it gets to the part where David starts giving a description. We're going to skip over. And so David... When it describes him, we can we might not read the whole thing. Y'all can go back and read it. <clears throat> the description of David was youngest son. I mean, if you're the youngest son, generally that not doesn't speak powerful. You know, you're the youngest. Um, he was a Ephrathite, which I meant to look that up and find out exactly something more into that, like what his tribe was known for, because we did a big study on tribes and you know like. Tribes, different tribes were known for different things, but I didn't even have time to look at that. But then he was a shepherd, so the description of David doesn't seem like a whole lot. So if you've got what David is wearing, because it says that he left early in the morning from the flock, so he was wearing shepherd's clothes, which was usually, you know, just a little easy, comfortable, and he definitely wasn't armor. Um, then his brother, if you go on down to like verse 29, his brother um, gives his description of David. And he says, 
you're just a keeper of a few sheep. You know, David might have had a thousand sheep that he kept up with, I don't know. But his brother makes sure to point out a few sheep. To me, that was kind of like, okay, so the enemy's trying to put doubt into this man, this boy that's going to go and kill this giant. And so he's making sure that everybody that's speaking to David before he goes out for this big battle is speaking things that, kind of like what the enemy speaks to us. You know, oh, well, you know, I mean, I don't know if the enemy speaks like this to Jason, but he might say, well, you're just a pastor of a few people. You know, well, you're just, you know, a housewife. You know, I mean, to you, I think that was like, I'm a housewife. You know, like, I'm proud of it. But there are some people that will think that's a cut down. Well, you're just a housewife, you know. Um, and then he says, um, what you do isn't important. You know, to me, that's what it kind of sounds like. His brother's telling him, you're just a keeper of a few sheep. But you're not important. You know, you need to just get on out of here. And then... He says something that kind of, the last time Jason read the whole thing, it kind of, I was like, what does this mean? And so he says, you're conceited and wicked wanting to watch the back. And I was like, what does that mean? So I was thinking about it, and we got a couple of men here. So raise your hand if you want to tell how would it make you feel if someone suggested that you can't or you wouldn't be willing to do something. Well, speak up. <laughs> this is interactive church. <laughs> I probably, uh, I probably want to prove a point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Depending on what it was. What you got, Tim? Well, it was basically the same thing that I just would want to show that I could. Yeah. So I'm kind of thinking that might be a little bit of what happened here because then, let me see if I can go down. So he left the flock, he came up here. David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men, and he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here, and whom did you leave for those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. And then David said, You know, hey, I'm going out there and kill that judge. <laughs> like, I kind of wonder, you know, like, People are people, and I think people were the same back then. Like, was it, it wasn't even conceived in David's mind to go and kill a giant when he first went down there. But then now he's a man, you know, and he's starting to get these, you know, like contests. You know, like I'm better than you, and I, you know, whatever. And so I'm kind of wondering, like, if he didn't say, "Hey, well, I'm going to do this just to show you that I can," you know. But we do have. I think he does have some a little bit more depth to him because he did know who he was. <clears throat> So, um, all right, so now, then we have, I'm going back and forth with my phone. So in verse 33, we have Saul's description of David. So Saul replied and said, you are not able to go out against the Phil this Philistine and fight for him. You are only a young man. And he has been a warrior from his youth. So, if this was you, I mean, like, imagine yourself. You're this young kid that showed up. You have Goliath's description. You know what he is. Then you have all of these other people from your brother to the king. I mean, I know young dudes that are, like, 15 or 16. I know Connor specifically. <laughs> you know, he thinks he's, like, awesome in his own mind. Maybe that was David. And so he's up there and this, the king that he wants to probably impress more than anybody, because I would want to impress the king, says, well, you're just a young man and he's been a warrior. You know? So if you, Connor, was having this conversation with Saul, um, and that's all the information, you know, you have all of the same information of what they've said about you. And then at that moment, somebody says, who are you? What would you say? Uh, that's, oh, I mean, I 
know what I could say here and be right in this sense? Well, just say whatever. <laughs> but probably not what I would have actually said. I mean, I believe the correct answer would be to say that you're the son of God, and therefore nobody can turn against you. It's what David says. It's a, the, the chosen people of God can say who can turn against you. So, if you needed to go out and fight somebody right now, are you going to believe all of this stuff that you've learned in church and Sunday school, you know, that you're a son of God and, you know, all of this kind of stuff? Or will you believe more like the things that you've heard and things that people have said and things that have been sung? Because a lot of times, not just what people say about you, but what you believe about yourself determines what you're willing and able to do, you know. So David, who knows what David did? Well, I remember it that he said, uh, the Lord was with me when I killed the, the lion and other beasts, the bear, and so I believe that the same God is with me that was with me that day will be with me when I stand to fight this thing. That's exactly what he said. He went back on what he knew about himself and what he knew about himself and the God that he had been serving, which is kind of what we're supposed to do. But I read on here, and this is like just straight up my notes, and I'm basically just kind of reading them because, you know, I'm not an awesome public speaker. But anyway, so but whether you have lived 10 years or 90 years, your family, like what your family how you grew up, what your family thinks, who, what they've said to you, what kind of things have been spoken to you, um, your life situations, you know, I mean, some of us have made crazy mistakes that label us for the rest of our, you know, or we feel like it's going to label us for the rest of our life, you know, um, so your life situations, you know, you got diagnosed with cancer, you know, and it's like that, that labels you forever, you know, that you're a cancer survivor, that you're or this or you're that, you know. Um, but those kind of things kind of like, kind of like, I, I feel like we're kind of labeled, put there in that story, you know, that all these different people were kind of labeling David ahead of time. And we do that as well, you know, like we have this stuff. And so <clears throat> then I got to thinking and I was like, all right, Lord, who am I? You know, like, and I'm going to be, like, very open and stuff, you know, because this, this is, like, my own thoughts. Like, okay, well, who am I? And so, <clears throat> so when I first asked myself that question, the thought that pops up first and that I even started off this whole sermon was, you know, not who am I, I'm Kim Blackwell, and I kind of went through that a little bit. The very first thought that I believe the enemy probably played into my mind that who knows when is that I'm shy and I'm quiet. You know, later on I grew up and figured out that that equals introvert, whatever, you know. Um, and I was and I was sitting there and I was like, well, how about the first description of me? Because, you know, I've done a lot of crazy things in this world. I think they're things we're doing. <laughs> I've done a lot of crazy things. I've done like some awesome things that most people probably wouldn't look at me and label me as shy and quiet, you know, now. But that's how I still think of myself. And so I kind of went through and I put bullet points because, you know, I'm awesome like that. And it says, who are you? And so I was like, all right, let's go to the and I'll get y'all to do this so y'all pay attention to this part for next week. So I put First and foremost, Kimberly Blackwell, which I love Kimberly Glenn, which I think has, you know, like, like I said, who you're born with, that shapes you, you know, to begin with. I was born in Mobile, Alabama, which technically makes me Southern. Imagine that. <laughs> you know? And that shapes you, and that shapes who, who you think you are and what you think you can do, you know, like where, even where you're born. And then, um, I don't even know why this thought propped up, but it did when I was thinking of this. I barely lived at birth. You know, like I was born with a hernia. Um, basically, my stomach busted open. I should not have been alive. Like, I, I literally like should not be alive. And then I had a club foot, and so I had to wear a brace for what, like, the first year or so of my life. <clears throat> and so I was like, why did that thought pop up? Because I wasn't even 
I shouldn't even have any memory of that. You know, I don't have any memory of it, but that's part of who I am, apparently, because the Holy Spirit made me think of it. And so then it was kind of like, maybe that's where, and I guess the Holy Spirit was just kind of te teaching me a little bit about myself this morning, is maybe that's where the shyness, the standing back and not, you know, like if you're born and you have major surgery immediately following birth, you know, you don't interact with people as quick. And then if you wear a brace, you know, maybe, I, and I don't know, my mom might know more than me, but maybe, you know, I didn't interact with people or people didn't interact with me because I was kind of broken to start with, you know. But anyway, I don't know if that's true or not, but, but that's kind of where I went. Um, we weren't rich, we weren't poor, you know, and that, I think that kind of makes a difference sometimes, like how you think. You know, if the Lord tells you to go and buy that motel and take care of those people and you grew up with the poor mindset of, you know, I can't, I mean, money's not something that we can ever come off. You know, it's different things like that limit you and it makes you stop and think like, okay, I can't defeat that giant because I don't know how to get a million dollars, you know. Um, so that kind of shapes you. And then I put that I was well loved. You know, like, and I, I, I think that's probably why I can love people. I probably should say that one for last. <laughs> but um, I, put, I did not excel in school because I was shy. I didn't ask questions. I was kind of lonely, you know, and I didn't make friends easily. And so it's like, even now, those kind of things still shape, like, how you do things because... I won't ask questions. I figure it out on my own. Like, I'm not going to go up there and ask anybody stuff. So, I put on here that I always got jobs and I always ministered kind of like from the background because I didn't want to be in the forefront because I liked being kind of in the back. And so, it was like, these are all kind of things that for years I saw as negatives, you know. But then... The Lord's kind of helping me start to see how some of these things are positive. Um, I put, I did and still do hate confrontation. Like, that's a, a big, big thing to who I am. And so it was like, okay. Then the Lord started telling me some of these things about myself later. That like, okay. I mean, that's a big part of who I am. It's like, I hate confrontation. Anybody that knows me knows that I will, I'm not going to confront you about stuff if I, you know, like, it's going to be the last thing that I do. But then the Lord said, after I started making this list, hey, but you were born a fighter. And I was like, okay, what does that have to do with anything? You know, like, um, you know, it was, he said, um, and I think that's sometimes good about, like, being honest with, like, who you are so that he can tell you who he sees. And so I guess it's kind of where this whole message is going. Because um, I wrote, I did and still do hate confrontation. And then right after that, I just felt in my spirit and said, yeah, but you were born a fighter. Just hours old, you confronted death and beat it. You know, and I'm like, well, I don't remember how I did that, <laughs> obviously. You know, I was a baby. Um, and I was like, I don't know how I did that, but I can tell you I know how to beat death a second time because I have eternal life at this point. Um, anyway, and so after I started listening and believing who the Father says I am, a good bit of this original stuff, the shy, quiet, you know, kind of started to fall away. And so I really want y'all to, this week, take a sheet of paper, and if you're, I mean, I feel like the whole point of our church, of Go Church, is we can be real, and be real with each other, you know, and allow each other to, like, let us see, because it, sometimes it's easier for us to see all of the stuff about ourselves as negatives, but it's really, if we listen to the Lord, and listen to the people that he put in our life, you know, then they can help us think, what, okay, you can take this as a negative, but this is how God can make it a positive, you know. And so, I put, 
becoming a leader, facing confrontation, facing fear, facing lack, and facing death. And I know most of y'all probably don't know, or most of y'all all know my story, but y'all don't necessarily. But I literally have been around the world. I faced death, I faced fear, I faced, you know, like, I know when the Lord first started calling me to do disaster missions, I could, Jason can attest for a year. I said, but I'm not a leader. You know, like, why am I having to do this? You know, like, I'll go with you and follow you, but I'm not a leader, you know? And, and it was all those things that, for whatever reason, whatever shaped me grow up in it to begin with, that I believed about myself, that didn't help me to be able to accomplish the goals. It's kind of standing in the way of what the Lord wants you to do sometimes. And so, um, it's, it's so much easier to fight Goliath in your life when you know and believe God for what he says you are. You know, and so definitely when you're making that list, be honest. You know, like, I mean, and I could probably have had like a whole lot more if I wouldn't have like 20 minutes, but, you know, like, make a list and say, okay, who am I? And what, what things shaped you? You know, I mean, I know that there's different things that, for sure things that I've done, and it's kind of neat that Brittany had kind of touched on that this morning, you know, that that I think shape whether or not I feel like I'm able to minister, you know, like if I, you know, especially like just recently, say, say your kid is not living the way that you feel like they live, then the enemy can come to you and say, well, you failed as a parent. Who are you to go and tell somebody else how to raise their kids? You know, I mean, just, just things like that, you know, that kind of like, it's really easy to believe the lies and so much harder to believe the truth. And so <clears throat> next week, I put it's going to be very interactive, maybe even scary, because I know Glenn's not going to want to do this, <laughs> to give voice to who you think that you are. But I believe this is how we grow and how we help each other grow and learn to use the, this as a weapon. Who you are, which is who God says you are. You know, it's not, because the, the most important part of that is write down, I mean, we know. You know who you feel like you are in your, in your heart and what things limit you from doing what you feel like the Lord's called you to do. But listen to him after you write those things down that might seem as a negative and find out, like, okay, what do you, who do you say I am? Because it's kind of a two-part thing. It's not just you know, who do I say I am, but who does he say he is, or say you are. So, this is like a long, drawn out, I hope y'all are following me, y'all maybe not, might be really glad to have Jason back. So, in Matthew 16, Simon Peter, Jesus asked Simon Peter like a super important question. He looked at Simon Peter and he says, who do you say I am? And we all know that, you know, some of the answers to that. Well, before that, some of the other disciples had said, well, some people say that you're John the Baptist, and some people say that you're Elijah, and some people say that you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says, blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Because see, Jesus knew something was coming that Peter didn't know about yet. He died so that Peter could become a son of God as well. You know, like Peter had no clue that when Jesus went to that cross that he was going to be a son, that he was going to become a joint heir. You know, and so I think that's why that scripture is so important and why Jesus was, you know, because he told him later, he said, this revelation, this thing that the Father has revealed to you is what I'm going to build my church on. You know, knowing who you are. Because I mean, in my opinion, you know, Peter, I mean, Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, all of those, I mean, they're all prophets. That's all like a good thing. If, but if Jesus would have been only a prophet, you know, if he wouldn't have really, that wouldn't have been good enough, you know. Prophets, they died and it did nothing for me. But Jesus, when a man knew who he was, when he died, eternal life as a joint heir, me being a son, happened. 
So what matters most isn't what anybody says you are, not even yourself. So when we go back to David, after Saul led the sin as young, David says, I killed a lion, I killed a bear, I rescued sheep, and the Lord who helped me do all that stuff will help me now. And so it's like, David knew who he was. You know, like he knew, even though everybody had spoke all of this doubt, and even though everybody had spoke all of this stuff that was not equal giant killer. You know, if he would have believed, if for one, for what, to start with, if he would have listened probably to his own self, because I can guarantee you, even if he is young and dumb and thinks he's awesome, there had to be some doubts, for sure. And those doubts come, I believe, from the things that shape us into who we think we are. You know, they shape us into who we think we are. And if we listen to who we think we are, who our family says we were, who people that knew us in our past say we were, oh, well, you're just a crackhead. Oh, well, you're just a, you know, prostitute. Oh, well, you're just, I think we probably had any. But anyway then it's really, really easy for that to limit what the Lord allows us to do, you know? Because then we think, well, I don't have what it takes, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. But when you listen to what the Lord says about that, even if it is a negative that is, for, I mean, there, there's truth to it. You know, there's truth to all of those things about me. But there is definite, there's definite things that the Lord can even use those situations to help you in the future to accomplish what he wanted you to do. So, anyway, who do you think you are? And who does God think you are? Next week. Anybody got anything they want to add? It wasn't as long as I thought it was going to be so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm usually talkative. You know so we're I'm only supposed to say who we think we are, right? Yeah. Because so, we don't know what God thinks. I mean, other than what it says in Scripture. Well, I mean, Personally. and we are going to get to that of the other W's, you know, like what does the Word say that I am? What does, but the Lord talks right now, you know, like there's definitely Scripture that says who He thinks I am mm -hmm. and what He believes about me. But there's also His live and breathe it like He'll speak to you right now what He thinks about you. You know, ask Him, you know, like who, who, who am I, Lord, to you, you know, and He'll tell you. You know, because he's placed those things inside of you, and he wants you to realize them, you know, and to know that you're not young, and you're not, you know, just a keeper of a few sheep, and you're not just, you know, this kid that showed up to watch a battle, because he probably did. I mean, I'm thinking if I know a 15-year-old kid, and they can sit up behind and watch a battle take place, they would probably be pretty excited about that, you know? Um... But then I'm sure there was a part, you know, that says, okay, well, but who do you say I am, Lord? You know, like, because I think Jesus wanted us, I think he modeled that so that we would stop and say, all right, wait, wait, wait. But who does the Lord say I am? You know, because he says what he thinks about you. And then the other part of that is when we share these lists next week, if y'all are willing, you know, it also gives us a chance to, have the people that we love and that we care about that are part of our family say, well, that's not what I see at all. I see this, you know, and give a little bit of confidence to, okay, well, maybe the way I'm seeing myself is because of those shapers early in life, and that's not really what the world sees, and that's not really what the Lord sees. Does that make any sense? So you want us to write that too? Yep. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I had lost, I lost a friend this, this past year. Uh, I got to sit and talk with his wife a couple of days ago, and I was reminded of one day that I called, and him and his wife were in Nashville in the airport, and their luggage was lost. And it was the oddest thing to me, because what he said first made what happened next happen. He said, Hello, it's so good to hear from the man of God. 
and I'm not used to being called that. And I said, well, how are you? And he said, my luggage is lost. And immediately came out of my mouth, because of what he said, I believe. But I agree with you according to Matthew 18, 19, the people that need to see that luggage will see it and it will come back to you. And he called me the next day and he said, it's back to me. I'm not used to being called a man of God, but when he answered the phone, he didn't say hello to him. It's good to hear from the man of God. And I, I cannot explain how that reverberated through my whole being. Are you going to be here next week? Y'all yeah, going to be gone. So, y'all want a pop quiz? Who do you think you are? <laughs> you don't have to do it right now, but and it's kind of hard well, on the top of your Things like that and hanging around with mm -hmm. LRB have taught me because they have been telling me who I am as they see me through the eyes of Jesus. And that friend that died told me, he said, I stopped by heaven this morning and I saw your dad and he waved to me and said, come see, because he was looking over the balcony of heaven and he looked down and I was there and he, he started telling him how proud he was of me. And he said, and then Jesus came up and they went off walking arm in arm saying, no, this is my boy, no, this is my boy. That's the things that I, that I have been able to store in my spirit is these people have been speaking into my life and telling me who Jesus sees me as. Do you believe me? I believe it with all of my heart. I believe it too. And I got to tell my friend this week again, I reminded her that the day he died, he's the one that saw this and I said I saw him and dad and Jesus walking arm in arm arguing over whose boy this guy is and you got three people that you love dearly claiming that you're his boy yeah. and you are I mean that's that's the thing is like knowing who you are Knowing who you are, like who you really are, who God created you to be, gives you so much freedom. For one, it takes it take it gives you freedom from the things of the past that say this is who you are, yeah. and freedom from the things that maybe your family said this is who you are, because you're not that little kid anymore. You know, you're, I mean, you're not, and it gives you freedom from who you think you are, because all of those things for years and years and years can keep you trapped basically and stuck not being able to do not being able to kill the Goliath because we we all have real true Goliaths that we don't even want to go out and we don't even want to listen to them we don't want to look at them and pretend they're not there you know when the Lord asks us to do them we come up with every excuse I mean David could have came up with a gazillion excuses there's a whole army to fight these people I mean how many times have we done that you know the Lord says hey I want you to go and do this and we're like well, somebody else will do it. There's more qualified people to do it. There's more um, capable people. There's more trained people. I mean, they, they, there was, how many did Jason say? Like at least probably 200 people that were trained with the sling that could have went and killed Goliath. They had a whole month, and none of them did it, you know. But it would have been easy for David to say, hey, I, I am just the boy. You know, I am just a kid. I'm just a keeper of a few sheep. I'm just, you know, all of those things were true. You know, they were probably they were probably a truth. But the bigger truth is what God said. And God said, you are a warrior that can kill a bear. And you are a warrior that can kill a lion. And you are a rescuer that can rescue sheep. So now I want you to go out here and do these things. And and if he would have chosen to, I mean, it really is like, who do you, who do you believe? You know, because if you believe him, you get to be a giant killer. You know, you get to cut off a giant's head and hold it up. I mean, I'm thinking like this little kid is holding up a massive giant head. I mean, I think that's kind of a crazy cool part of the story, you know. <laughs> he used his own sword that weighed so much, chopped off his head, picked it up, and brought it to the king. This king that said, well, you're just young. 
yeah, you're not capable of this, but whatever, go do whatever you want to do. And he gets to come back and say, look what I did. I mean, how cool is that, you know? And how cool is that as a kid of our father, our king, to not believe all the stuff that everybody else says and to come up and be like, here's my giant head, you know? I led this person to Christ, you know? I done this. And, and be able to present our king with our victory, the spoils of victory, you know? And then the even cooler part is he got spoils of victory as well. He got to get the king's daughter, <laughs> a whole bunch of money, you know, recognition. He went from being a little boy to being the king's son and son-in-law, basically, which didn't turn out good for him later in life. But anyway, for, for the time being, that was pretty cool, you know? And then, you know, I mean, he went from being unrecognized shepherd boy to being king himself later on. So there's a reason why we want to fight giants. So figure out who you are so you can fight them. I had a friend that passed away a couple of years ago. When he was 17, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he kept going in remission. He kept getting cancer and died in his 80s. And I promise you, when I said I worked with you know, I met this hour in Mississippi and he did the Sunday school lesson. That was the most profound teaching I believe I've heard in my life. Because cancer didn't define him. Jesus did. Well, all those things that y'all put on y'all's list next week don't let them define y'all. So. Are you going to end it? Well, I'm going to you. <laughs> oh, look at there. All the stuff he got. <laughs> <laughs> it was there. Oh, you didn't know that was there? I didn't know it was there. I wouldn't have been like straining my eyes to be able to see my home screen. Yeah. Well, it didn't really keep up with you that well, so. Well, well let's stand and pray. And, um... <laughs> Father, I just ask that you would reveal to each and every one of us this week who you say we are. But not just that, but what do you think about us? What your favorite thing about us is? What amazes you about us? What, what you love most about, about us individually? And I ask that you would speak to each and every person here what you love about them this week. Go with them and use them to be a miracle to somebody this week. And we declare that in the